Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to the first episode of the Digital Dialogue series, Supporting the Frontline. We will take a look at how we can leverage digital health to support, empower, and protect the healthcare workforce beyond COVID-19. On behalf of HIMSS, I would like to thank Philips and our members for their support of this Digital Dialogue series and this very important topic. Before we get started, I would like to explain some of the ways that you can participate using this platform. This presentation is being recorded and you are currently in listen-only mode as you're part of the audience. I would like to draw your attention to the question and answer options. Please put your question in the Q&A box and click send or put your questions in the chat box and message the host. We encourage you to ask questions at any time as these will be addressed in the Q&A part of this webinar at the end. If you experience any technical difficulties during the event, please send a message to the host. Now, without any further delay, I would like to turn today's webinar over to the moderator. Dr. Alessi, the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, welcome um, to this um, seminar which we're having today, which is going to be really quite uh, exciting and also uh, quite engaging. Um, <clears throat> first thing I want to do is to introduce the uh, panelists um, uh, and really I'd ask them to say a few sentences about themselves uh, as well. Um, so let's start with Afsal Chowdhury. So good afternoon everybody. Um, my name is Afsal Chowdhury. I'm a renal physician by training. I'm the Director of Digital and the Chief Clinical Information Officer at Cambridge University Hospitals in the UK. Um, we are an academic medical centre with just over a thousand beds. We're a HIMSS stage six hospital and uh, we provide specialist services for a population of four to five million and more regional services for a local population of approximately half a million. Thank you. Uh, let's now move to uh, Dr. Peter Gokey. Hello everybody. My name is Peter Gokey. I'm a radiologist by training and later became a CIO in that position I was CIO of the UKE Hamburg Eppendorf when it became the first HIMSS 7 hospital in Europe. And uh, now I'm Chief Digital Officer at Charité Berlin, which is uh, Europe's largest academic medical center, uh, consisting of four different sites in Berlin with a connection wide or nationwide connection network and delivering care for more than 3 million people. Thank you, Peter. And finally, Dr. Jan Kimpen. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Jan Kimpen. My training was in pediatrics. I have worked in pediatrics for 25 years. And maybe by coincidence, but I was trained as an infectious disease person. So I worked with respiratory syncytial virus for all this time in pediatrics. After that, I went to the C-suite. I became the CEO of the University Medical Center in Utrecht. And after eight years, I moved to the corporate world. And since 2016, I am the global chief medical officer at Philips. Thank you. And we have four physicians, because I'm a primary care physician uh, originally by training. I'm now a senior advisor of Public Health England, as well as uh, chief clinical officer of HIMSS. Fantastic. So we're going to have a discussion today, really, about a subject that needs very little introduction. And of course, it's uh, the COVID pandemic, but taking and looking at COVID from a significant uh, and important angle. Uh, COVID, of course, is the disease of the 21st century in some respects, in so far that it spread dramatically fast, outpacing most health and care systems globally in their ability to respond to it. Um, uh, and really, already there are some very significant learnings that um, have come out of that. One in terms of the importance of using uh, digital modalities, digital technologies and information, not only to treat the population, uh, which is the COVID population, but also, of course, the importance of maintaining uh, treatment of the non-COVID population. And in a lot of countries, we have seen uh, uh, death rates um, uh, associated with the non-COVID population which are as bad, and in some cases, even worse than the COVID population itself. But there's a third dimension, which I think uh, perhaps we haven't quite appreciated as much, 
and that is the workforce. And when I say the workforce, it's not only uh, assisting the workforce in their role managing um, uh, the COVID pandemic and the non-COVID um, uh, patients, which they normally have to manage uh, at the same time, uh, but also managing uh, the process of the, the great changes and changes to the business models which they're having to undergo, uh, as well as the really quite difficult situations uh, which they're having to work in at the moment. And I think that needs to be uh, really front and center in terms of um, uh, how we're managing uh, to assist uh, the workforce uh, and leveraging digital health to empower and protect the workforce during this time. So let's start with um, the first question, really. Uh, we know how COVID has changed the environment. Uh, we know that uh, digital modalities have suddenly become the way in which we manage care. They've moved from sometimes 5% to 85% of ways in which we interact uh, with uh, patients. Um, <clears throat> and we also know um, um, how difficult it is to manage that process within a large hospital system. Uh, and the, the need to develop a whole host of different processes um, uh, to manage different populations. So I really would like to ask Afsal first around your views and your sense of how did you manage this process? How difficult was it? Uh, and what were the real surprises associated with this? I think it, it won't be a surprise to anybody working in a hospital at the moment that each hospital has undergone quite a significant upheaval in the management of, of COVID patients. We, for example, segregated our hospital into, into COVID wards and non-COVID wards, so-called red and green wards. And that has meant a complete reconfiguration of not only physical characteristics of the wards, for example, to create areas where people can uh, put on and take off their protective equipment, but also um, the arrangements by which we staff those wards, whether or not it be medical or nursing. We've seen massive expansions of our intensive care units with, with uh, uh, additional device integration, and we've even implemented remote monitoring, not between the hospital and outside the hospital, but within the hospital, to allow staff who are segregated in one area of the hospital to provide expertise to clinicians who are perhaps less experienced in another part of the hospital. Um, we cohorted our doctors into teams that were physically located on one individual ward, um, and whilst we tried to obviously as much as we could to cohort our patients in the same way, inevitably you will have patients who will have shared needs amongst a number of medical teams who can't be on the ward belonging to every team simultaneously. So we've seen a lot more remote review of, of clinical care um, within the hospital. And I, and I think the, the other thing that I, I would want to say um, initially is that in doing this, we've worked really hard to use digital tools within our electronic patient record to support junior staff who may well have been exposed in circumstances that were, were, were considerably more stressful and considerably more high paced than they had previously anticipated. Here in the UK, a number of um, uh, final year medical students were, were sort of uh, fast-tracked through their last few months of training into live ward environments to help augment the workforce and similarly with our student nurses and the benefit of our electronic patient record has allowed us to create order sets and prioritization tools that support those junior people with the knowledge and expertise of the senior ones even when you physically can't get to them. That, that's remarkable because basically you're assisting them with clinical decision support you're assisting them, in essence, with uh, doing the job and the data governance uh, and clinical governance, which is sort of built into a system. Um, uh, so, um, uh, and that, that um, was really quite a successful deployment? Oh yeah, very much so. And I, and I think, you know, you, you, you can't underestimate the, 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 both the physical, but also the mental stress of working in a COVID positive environment that's had on, on, on all members of staff. And so what we've seen is, people's motivation to do to do the right thing for their patients to do the right thing for their colleagues has seen a massive um, take up of the tools that we've put in place perhaps more than we'd ever seen before where we previously had sort of order sets and and decision support rules and and but the adherence to that has been really very very striking and in particular 
people have really worked with us to develop rules within that decision support that allows them to feel comfortable that they're, for example, they're seeing the sickest patients first each day, that they're making sure that they haven't missed out perhaps more um, unusual sorts of investigations that they wouldn't normally think of, but which are absolutely pivotal in the care of COVID patients. Thank you. Thank you, Afzal. Absolutely fascinating. Peter, um, in your case, we're in, we're in Charité now, we're in Berlin, the biggest, one of the biggest hospitals in Germany, one of the most famous hospitals in Germany. Um, is, your, um, um, is your experience similar to Afzal's in terms of deployment and your response to COVID? That's, well, definitely quite comparable to what Afzal, Afzal said. Uh, of course, first we had to identify sections of the hospital where we can handle COVID-19 patients. Charité is a quite old building block and you have several separated buildings. So it was quite easy to identify regions where we can put COVID patients in isolation. We had in the past given a lot of effort into building of several ICUs. So ICU were never a problem during the crisis. That was our first surprise that we never reached more than 64% of our capacity of our capacity of uh, ICU beds. On the other hand, we quickly created, just for information, a nationwide network where you can see every day, every hour, where any ICU bed is available in Germany to put a patient in. Next, a relevant and crucial thing was just information of the staff. We have more than 25,000 employees and you have to have them inform about the new SOPs and, and standard procedures and changes and measurements taken by the board just to make clear everybody knows what to do, how to handle patients, how to handle visitors who, are, who have not been allowed to enter the hospital grounds. So a lot of information was really a key measurement in fighting that COVID pandemic. And what we learned quite early during the crisis is there was a lot of, a lot of stress for our staff by contact to post potentially infected patients. So we quite early to, we decided to completely switch our ambulatory care management to video consultations. And we very quickly developed an app that uh, helped for a patient to catch his symptoms and make clear where he has to enter the hospital with the result of that app. And of course you cannot in, that, in a few days only create a standard interface of that app to our hospital information system or EMR, but uh, we managed it to get all the answers of that app into a QR code that can be scanned from the patient's smartphone without physical contact and thus way put it, put, it, put it over into our EMR. So that was really crucial to inform staff and give them digital tools to, to relieve the stress of patient contact. Yep, and what a way to demonstrate that. Um, uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, Jan, you have a global overview, really, um, uh, uh, in terms of the places you interact with um, uh, all over the world. Um, is your perception um, really very similar to the um, uh, two um, uh, uh, little demonstrations we had as to what happened from Afzan and from Peter? Yeah, uh, uh, in, indeed it was. With, with all the customers we talked with, we talked with over the last five months or so, four or five months or so, they have the same stories. They are similar in all parts of the world. So maybe let me give the, the, an, an other perspective to it, the, the, the angle of, of the industry. When COVID uh, hit the, the world on a global scale, we had to, to change our business almost from one day to the other. And we rallied very fast behind what we call the triple, the triple duty of care. First of all, we had to take care of our employees. We have 80,000 people working for Philips across the globe. And a lot of them, for example, our field service engineers, they are in hospitals all the time. So all of a sudden you are part of the care delivery system with everything that is involved there during a pandemic like this one. The second um, 
duty of care was of course business continuity in these in these challenging times but then the most important one is to serve and uh, support our customers in what they have to do today and that had an enormous impact on us as a company first we saw some of our solutions being less in demand for the moment and that had to do which is a big problem with postponement postponed care and care that could not be delivered anymore because there was no room in the hospitals talk about um, uh, image guided therapy cat labs devices that went down a lot because these patients have have their treatments being postponed that will hit us uh, a few months from now i guess um, and then there were parts of our company that we had to of our business that we had to ramp up dramatically think about ventilation solutions invasive non-invasive ventilation uh, solutions with all the challenges with 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 with, with subcontractors and 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 parts of machines that had to come together and that had to to double and quadruple the production of these machines in order to cater for the demand of the marketplace second is telehealth coming up with with new solutions as peter already talked about new apps for for covid monitoring remote patient monitoring and platforms i give you a, one example from the netherlands where we in 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 a few weeks time we made it possible with a platform that all the hospitals could share the data of the COVID patients seamlessly from one hospital to the other. I have run a hospital as a CEO, and I know that it was almost impossible, this very, very uh, uh, strong collaboration between hospitals. Now, it, it was not a nice to have anymore now, it was a need. So patients could shift from one hospital to the other and the data would follow them seamlessly. And then lastly is the demand, the high demand for point of care diagnostics, like for example with ultrasound. So you see that a company as Philips had to rebalance its activities from one day to the other, catering for the needs of our customers. So in many respects, Jan, what you describe is a microcosm, well, not micro, but relatively micro, compared to the um, um, uh, behavior of whole countries, which were basically changing what they were doing from day to day, thinking in terms of managing their workforce a little bit more effectively, because in many respects, this is not an area we have really covered ourselves in glory over the years in terms of managing our workforce really really strongly and also an understanding i was struck by your comments around cath labs um, um, it is becoming very much clearer that um, uh, the effect of the pandemic is going to have a very long tail in terms of the effect it's going to have in the future because clearly uh, people because they're not getting the care they require for their non-communicable diseases we could well see an increase in the numbers of strokes, heart attacks, dementia, everything else that goes with that. So this issue of the management of non-COVID patients, it's, um, uh, I think this is going to recover really quite quickly as governments, big health institutions understand that they can't ignore this for much longer because clearly it is no solution stopping cervical screening. Uh, it is no solution stopping vaccinations. Uh, mm -hmm. in childhood, because clearly these are things which have to continue at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And this will pick up pretty fast again, I guess, uh, because a lot of this care is being postponed. However, we should really be sensitive about patients that were inadvertently harmed because of the COVID pandemic while they were not suffering from COVID themselves. Yeah. And if you look only at two examples, one in the Netherlands, we have this national registry of cancer diagnosis. And in March and April, there were 3,000 less cancer diagnoses in the Netherlands only, which is a small country. And that is no sign that COVID one way or the other prevented cancer from happening. It is diagnoses that were not, that were not made or could not be made or patients that were afraid going to the hospital whatever reason it is but it was less 
And then the second example is from New York. I read a, a report that uh, in normally uh, it, is, it is like 35%, 35 people dying per month from sudden cardiac arrest in the middle of the street in the city. In the first months of the COVID epidemic, that went up to 290. That means that all these, all these patients who probably could have gotten a curative treatment out of COVID were dying now in the streets because they could not get to proper care because it was simply not available. That, that's, that's something we have to keep in mind and ramping up that non-COVID care as fast as we can do it. And I realize that we are going to put another level of pressure on the healthcare professional doing that. Yep. And really, um, I'll give you another example you mentioned too. There's a third one, the excess deaths. Uh, certainly we have seen in uh, the United Kingdom uh, and we have seen in Italy and in Spain. Uh, are really very significant numbers. In, in some cases, they are nearly bigger than the deaths associated with COVID. This is a significant issue. Yeah. But you mentioned something else which I found fascinating. You mentioned supporting your, your staff, really. And this is the, the nature of the second question, um, uh, really, which I think I'll start, I'll start with you, um, considering we're talking now at the moment. And it's around supporting the workforce the workforce in hospitals, the workforce really trying to manage this pandemic. Uh, complexity in the workforce in terms of the way they behave and what their duties are is nothing new. Um, uh, uh, as we move into the 21st century, we've moved from evidence-based care for populations to more and more evidence-based care for smaller and smaller groups of people coming to evidence-based care for me. Uh, and there's a real challenge here on how we manage digital transformation and also support the workforce rather than the reverse, rather than add even more complexity to a complex situation. And really, I, I, I'd like to get your sense in terms of where this is going and the importance of involving uh, the clinicians themselves in this process, because uh, if we don't, we're going to increase the levels of burnout we're already seeing and the levels of mental distress uh, we're already seeing amongst our workforce which of course is diminishing as we age. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we see the world is, uh, is digitizing. That is, that is so much of an open door that it almost does not need mentioning. And healthcare is jumping on that wagon also. However, the, the, the downside of it is that, that companies as ours had to recognize over the last five or six years or so that all these digital tools we brought to the market, to the doctors, was increasing their burden rather than easing their burden. They spent more time behind the computers than with patients. They added an extra five or 10 hours to their work week, just being busy with digital tools of which we thought that were helpful for them. Now it's not all it's not all gloom and doom. We did a um, an, our our yearly uh, future health index survey, and we focused that this year on the healthcare professionals that are younger than forty years old, and we asked them about how digital was influencing their day to day work, and sixty five percent of them told us that electronic health records were Act, ha, were having actually a positive impact on their work. So there is a positive side to it, but there is another side to it that it should not increase their burden. So we have to integrate these digital tools much more in, the, uh, in, their, daily, in their daily workflow. And I give you four examples where we as Philips are working on continuously, but other companies are too. First of all is embedded decision support. What we believe in is that the amount of data that is, that is thrown over the healthcare professionals is so much that a human mind cannot manage it. They cannot digest the enormous number of data that have to be integrated. And I, if I take a step back to when I was still a pediatrician, and I would imagine that I would bring together myself 
the genomics data, the, the, the imaging data, the, the lab data, and not the same number as I dealt with 30 years ago, but an, an exponential growth of data today, I couldn't do it anymore. So digital tools need to bring together all these data, overlay it with critical analysis, a good visualization functionality, so that it can help the doctors in their decision support, instead of bringing more data to them that they have to integrate themselves. That's the first yeah. thing. The second thing is we, we are working very hard on usability and on design so that, that the user interface is more logical and not as clunky as it is now. Now doctors often have to go, when they have one patient in front of them, they have to go to three or four or five applications and log in and log out each time again. This usability need to improve. Third is operational productivity. We will not be talking about money today, I guess, but we all know that the, the costs of healthcare are rising too fast and that is and, and too, too steep, which is completely unsustainable. So digital tools that can improve the workflow in the radiology department, and, and Peter can talk about this much better than I can, in the EICU or in the ICU, making use of EICU, remote ICU monitoring, that is going to increase the productivity in a hospital. Yeah. And finally, digital tools, and we learned that from these young healthcare professionals, should make collaboration easier. Young doctors want to work together. They want to be in a team, and they want that team to be supported by, by the digital world so that they can work together, be together, and make a decision together. So, and, and I, I would like to close here by saying that we have to listen to these healthcare professionals, especially the young ones, because if we are not listening to them, we will lose them. 25% of the doctors and nurses that we interviewed, and we interviewed 4,000 of them, had once in a while a thought of leaving their profession altogether. And that would be a drama for the for the industry as a whole thank you thank you Jan. um peter let's go to let's go to the venerable um uh, um charité in berlin in terms of you introducing uh, technology amongst um uh, all um uh, your staff uh, and then trying to ensure they actually manage that process i mean what's your perception around um, uh, the introduction of digital technologies uh, within workforces? So definitely COVID-19 was a booster for digital transformation, I think in any hospital. And um, I totally agree with lots of Jan's remarks. One failure of the past was really, we created those tools in our departments of administration or IT and handed that over to the physicians and it wasn't not as helpful as planned. And if I think back at my time in radiology, I worked there for 12 years, why did I started loving IT tools? They made me independent. So if the image was on my screen directly from the machine, I need no staff to process films. If yeah. I can use speech recognition, I need no transcription service. So it put a lot of burden away from me and makes me independent. What we did in later was we created tools to collect more data and handed over the burden of data collection to our staff. And this was an add on to their workforce and didn't make them independent, it makes them dependent. So when we started to create those COVID app, it wasn't, of course it was done by IT specialists, but it was directed by physicians. We really went to our Corona survey stations and asked them, what are you doing here? What do you need to make your life easier? And they came up with a very simple web app that was created within days. And there was no centralized data collection, no, no big privacy discussions. It was a very straightforward, simple app, easy to handle, and that helped. And what, what was mentioned by Jan before, they really like to collaborate. So the next thing they would like to have was something like a WhatsApp for physicians. Of course, you cannot give them WhatsApp. They use it, of course, but that's not the way we want to go. 
So we started the implementation of Matrix, which is a protocol and gives you a really privacy ready communication like WhatsApp. And that's what, what they ask for. And that's what you have to deliver. Because the, the, the thing is, if you give some tools, the tool must have them, and not the administration. And that was a mind shift I've seen in many hospitals to have more involvement by physicians. And once physicians are involved and part of the solution and not part of the problem, the speed of digital transformation really increases. And what we are now trying to do is to keep this pace and keep those physicians involved. So we created boards and they directly work together with developers. Of course, that costs them time, but when you show them that with that time, they really get a better tool, they are happy to invest that time. So Afzal, this is a wonderful entree. Um, uh, here we are in Cambridge, you know, one of the premier hospitals uh, in England. Uh, and we have those words from Peter in our ears around um, doctors are part of the solution, uh, not the problem. Um, there's been a history all over the deployment of uh, digital technologies in an element of pushback uh, from physicians in terms of whether this affects them, because they've always viewed it in the past as being something which interferes with clinical flow rather than enhances it. How did you manage it in Cambridge? So, so I, I, firstly, I would say I, I agree wholeheartedly with, with Jan and Peter. I think what we saw actually was a sort of release of an approach that we'd been trying to pursue for some time, but had always been uh, hampered by the fact that clinicians were, were, were busy doing their regular jobs. And just as Peter said, you know, trying to free up that time for them to come and engage in the solutions was, was always a challenge. But, but in this circumstance, that, that barrier was taken away. And so I talked earlier about the order sets and the tools for, um, for prioritization of, of reviewing patients. That was driven and in part designed by um, a, a, a combination of our respiratory infectious disease and hematology clinicians who said, this is what we want the tools to look like. This is the functionality that we want them to deliver. And we sat with them and, and we designed that. Um, we talk about ha how we support our, our staff. One of the, I think, the important things that we found in supporting staff um, to, were two things, really. One was there were a whole range of staff who didn't need to be in the hospital, but who could do their work very effectively from home. Um, and we have seen a 400% increase in remote access from the hospital, so that at peak times, it's, it's about 1,500 concurrent users, but throughout a working day, it will be well over 2,000 to 2,500 people. And historically, there had been some challenges towards us and others in the UK about implementing hospital-wide IT systems with, that were integrated and coherent and consistent. And yet, the advantage of being able to have systems that, that join together in a seamless way was that work that could be done at home was done at home. If we'd still been on the historical legacy systems that we had, people would have had no choice but to come to the hospital. So I think that's one aspect. The second thing is you, you support your staff by giving them confidence in the way in which they're caring for their patients. Staff were seeing patients dying regularly, patients being incredibly ill and deteriorating very quickly. We worked, our clinicians worked very carefully to define, um, in conjunction with some national guidance, a process of um, how we, we risk stratify and we assess the vulnerability of patients so that we can make sensible decisions about how, how we care for them. And Th that what that meant was that the staff themselves had confidence that the trust that the hospital was supporting them to do the right thing and these were done using electronic tools very simple questions nothing complicated again as peter said a set of very simple questions but carried all the way through with the patient at every step in their care so that staff felt that you know my clinical expertise is being reflected in the system to deliver that care for the patients and i and i you know one of my real learnings from this is don't overcomplicate things 
talk to the clinicians about what they want because often it's, it's very, very simple pieces of information, but it's that persistence through the clinical pathway that is essential. And it's, uh, thank you. And I think there's some real gems in what you said, Afzal, around um, uh, don't overcomplicate things, uh, around engage with people and make them feel that um, their views and also their inputs are not only valuable, but actually are pivotal in making the system work. If I look to myself, when I first became a physician, there were probably a dozen pathways. And it's, it was in the 80s, it's not that long ago. Um, um, and really all we had to do at night when we were on take in a hospital is ensure that we used only a couple of drugs, some painkillers, some opiates, some, some, some drugs to help with um, uh, excretion of urine, diuretics, uh, some other drugs to do with the heart, but not that many things really. Uh, and we wanted to make sure people were safe, in a bed, warm, um, uh, and really they were sorted out the next morning. But now look at the number of pathways these individuals today, these young physicians, are having to cope with. It's enormous, and it's not only on a population base, it's much more of an individual base now. Uh, and that's before we even go to what Jan was talking about, which is overlaying your genetic information, et cetera, onto that. They are really inundated. So the issue of simplicity, I think, is a really, really important and valuable one, because I think it's the only way we're going to manage to maintain them uh, engage them and ensure that they continue doing the most important thing. Technology should be there to liberate the physician to do what they should be doing best, which is really interacting with people. Um, uh, it's not a collection of metrics, which is medicine, and we all uh, understand this. Um, there's a final question I want to put to you, because we have a few minutes left, and it's really around what steps we can take, really, uh, to prepare frontline workers uh, for the second wave, the potential second wave. And we know, of course, that it's possible, if not likely, we will get a second wave of uh, coronavirus. And of course, in the temperate climates uh, we live in, uh, in Europe, certainly, it is certainly possible that that will coincide with a flu pandemic, or, or rather the flu epidemic we get year on year. So having the two together is, of course, going to be a real problem. Um, so really, you know, the preparation, um, uh, what steps are you taking and what steps do you feel we should be taking? So uh, this time, let's start with Peter, please. Well, it has never been clearer than with COVID-19 that it costs human lives if we can't access and process our health data. So we started a, de a decentralized but coordinated approach to record data of every COVID patient in Germany, and we would like to expand this to our European partners, because the more data, the better the decisions we can, we can derive from that. And we have the so-called Gecko standard data set. Gecko is the German Corona consensus. And that was the first time I can remember that 34 different university hospitals in Germany have been able to manage it, to create a standard, a consensus on a data set within within two weeks. And this is really helpful. And it's based on international standards. And I think that's the way we should go. We need something like a European health data space to collect that data, make it available to help our clinicians and, and pharma industry to, to create drugs and procedures to maintain the course we have to really be able to save those patients. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'll be coming back to that because I've got a question uh, from the audience uh, already, uh, which is around European cooperation. But it's fascinating that uh, one has managed in a country like Germany, which of course is very well known for its federal structure, very well known for its uh, very, um, uh, I won't use the word rigid, but certainly robust uh, interpretation of GDPR and the difficulties associated with the land and sharing information. So for this to happen in two weeks is certainly unprecedented. You're absolutely correct. Uh, Afzal, your views uh, around preparing for the second wave. Uh, so I would, I would agree with Peter. I think there's, in the sense that there's a lot to be gained from the data. We're very lucky in the UK with Public Health England and, and 
the data that hospitals, primary care physicians have been submitting that I think will give us very valuable insight into a, a more refined and a more informed and a more educated approach to to risk stratifying uh, patients um, and the public going forward. As I, as I mentioned earlier, we, we've already started a program for that for every patient who's been considered for our um, uh, ambulatory outpatient clinics, clinicians are going in and using some very simple tools are recording what's the risk if we do see the patient in terms of their vulnerability to COVID, but what's the risk if we don't see the patient? So that we're starting to, to look at then what are the algorithms that we can apply to that that help to define the thresholds in different categories and cohorts of patients that allow us to make meaningful judgments. It, as you said, Charles, yourself earlier, this care has to continue one way or the other. So the important thing is that we, we need to use the learning that we acquire every day, every week, including not just nationally, but internationally, as Peter said, to, to give us the best understanding of when is it safe to do something um, in respect of COVID and when is it better to delay. Um, yeah. But, but uh, and, 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 you know, data and analytics underpin all of that. Yeah. Jan, your sense? Yes, the very, very simple answer would be, uh, Charles, let us continue doing what we did so well during COVID, also for the second wave and further down the road. Yes. And I, I give you a few examples of this. First, we, we see, for example, that from, a, from a, a very recent Frost and Sullivan report that the the, the, the annual growth of telehealth has increased from 28 to 40 percent and for remote patient monitoring even with 150 percent so it, it it caters for a need that is sure so in order to to make that sustainable and not let it flow away again when the crisis subsides is first of all make investments of in telehealth possible make these temporary reimbursement mod modes that we see now everywhere in the world make yeah. them definite don't pay for tele telehealth only during this crisis but continue this reimbursement also afterwards that's a very very important part because that will incentivize hospital systems of buying this stuff and paying for it because all hospital systems know that the return on investment will not be immediate, will be long term. So they will only be incentivized if they know that they this reimbursement will stay there for a longer time. Second, um, keep this or, or do not strengthen again this whole regulatory framework. We all know that regulatory agencies have loosened up a little bit their criteria in order to make it possible for telehealth, for new, new products, new solutions, new machines to hit the market, also new drugs, by the way. So it would be good that, this, that, that now that we have learned how some regulatory requirements are so obstructive for good things coming to the market, don't immediately go back to this very stringent way of working. A very good example, which is also catering for an aging workforce, is pathology. In the US until pre-COVID, it was mandatory for pathologists to read biopsy slides in the hospital on site. Now, during COVID, there is a temporary regulation that pathologists via secure VPN connections and digital pathology can read uh, uh, biopsy slides at home for the same reimbursement. So don't turn that back after COVID because pathologies are, it's an aging, an aging part of our workforce. Young people do not want to sit till 12 o'clock in the hospital. They want to look at the slides at home, maybe during the night over the weekend, make that possible also in the future. That's the second. The third one is what Peter alluded to already, make sharing of data easier. Use a European digital data platform. Uh, there are examples, Gaia X is one of these examples. Make them work. And then the fourth one, and that's a little bit more down the road, is build telehealth digitalization in the education and training of medical students. 
Yep. We learned from the Future Health Index that 75%, 75% of these young nurses and doctors say that their education did not prepare them for the job that they had to do later. That, that, is, that is dramatic. That's almost embarrassing. So we should, yep. we should bring all these digital tools into the education of our young people in order to keep them engaged and motivated. It's such a beautiful workspace to be in. It's a shame that we are losing 30% of those because they, they don't feel prepared uh, uh, for their jobs. Yep, uh, absolutely. Um, um, and I think this sets us up really quite nicely to take some questions from the audience. Uh, there'll be two types of questions from the audience. One of the ones I'm going to ask uh, today, which we already received, and uh, if you ask others, and could you please keep on asking them, uh, we'll respond to them by email, because it's important your questions are responded to, uh, and they will be responded to, so please keep them coming. But let's, let's really start with the European dimension here, because, um, I, Peter, you mentioned it, Jan, you mentioned it, and we have a real opportunity here. Uh, around uh, the European Union to really start to gather data in a way which will enrich uh, the potential for us to have the data points we need to gain the insights we require to let AI do its job uh, to help us with the workforce associated, for example, with histopathology, which um, uh, Jan was talking about, uh, and with radiology as well. Um, uh, and we have some examples of how uh, these things could work, but it's proven to be really quite difficult in Europe to get nations to really coalesce together and be willing to share that data, to willing to use that interoperability. We have some examples, you know, from Finland to Estonia to Luxembourg, but I know it's much more difficult with bigger countries, of course. Um, uh, but how do you feel we could make uh, data uh, exchange better to manage COVID in a more efficient way. And we also need to remember, of course, issues to do with the secondary use of data. I think it would be unwise to ignore that because it's really quite important. So, Peter, over to you to give a sense of where you think this is. So, we have seen several initiatives in the past that never went really live. One example, of course, is uh, the International Patient Summary, which is a very comprehensive and good structured document that would help to, to collect data of patients in a structured way according to international standards and we can share this. We even created the so-called national contact points which yeah. are more or less routers to exchange those data. So there is some infrastructure prepared and available and now with the pressure on that Gaia-X approach I'm quite confident that we can use this. If you look at Gaia-X, this is intended to serve eight different industries. But 25% of all approaches to use that platform are coming from healthcare. So I think with the data need of healthcare and the new possibilities and chances available, we can now use that pressure and time and the moment and the momentum to really make a big step forward. And once that data pool is established, it will never go away. Yeah, absolutely. So, P um, Afzal, we had, uh, we had Peter uh, really uh, tell us never to lose uh, the opportunity given to us by a good crisis. And wow, do we have a good crisis? In other words, do we have a good opportunity? Um, so what's your sense in terms of actually keeping that momentum going um, around how we can make sure that the post-COVID era is not time limited, but this really is, sorry to use a term which people use quite a lot now, a pivot point, uh, and really health and care will never be the same again. So I, th I absolutely agree that that's what needs to happen. So I think there are a number of challenges. Um, so we too have moved to uh, a significant patient, proportion of our patients having uh, telephone consultations and video conference uh, in, in this month alone it will be almost two-thirds of patients but some of that is delivered through a multitude of different systems and and there is a sustainability piece there which is individual institutions or healthcare systems can only sustain so many versions of the same thing but what we need to do is to take the learning that we have from 
whatever particular uh, product that we're using and saying the learning from outpatient video conferencing is such and such and this is how we're really going to consolidate that and embed that in our in our workflows i think it comes back absolutely to to keeping our conditions absolutely front and center in this sustainability and ongoing use but most important delivery of benefit for patient care only comes when the clinicians are absolutely 100% um, engaged in that process. And, and I think my learning from so much that we've done with COVID is don't try and do 50 or 60 things at once, do five or six things, get them really understood, get them deployed, get them embedded, they become sustained, they become part of the fabric of your institution, then move on to the next five or six, and then the next five or six. And I think what you end up with over a period of time is a portfolio of delivered change in workflow that is embedded and meaningful, as opposed to a whole series of in parallel projects that never quite get off the ground. And certainly in two or three years time, most people struggle to remember even what they were called, what were you trying to do, and, and, and no understanding. And the last thing I would say about this is, the metrics that you use to judge these things needs to be, again, relatively simple. If I'd gone to my chief financial officer, if, uh, you know, even six months ago and said, I want to move 2000 of our staff off site to work from home. And this is the infrastructure that I need to do that. He would have said to me, well, you know, tell me every tens of pounds, hundreds of pounds, thousands of pounds. Tell me every little fine detail of benefit that you will get in order to set against that case. And yet now that it's done, in no circumstances are we going to revert that. The, the, the value that we see, the productivity from our staff that we see is, is absolutely much, much greater than we ever anticipated and I think will be sustained. But historically, I don't think we were educated enough to be able to measure that benefit or understand that benefit. So, so there has to be a change in approach to, to, to that measurement of benefit if we're going to see an ongoing sustainability of this change in behavior. That's a big challenge, um, uh, Afzal, a really big challenge, because it's actually quite difficult to measure that. I mean, spatially and, and temporarily, uh, until, unless you take a far longer time scale. Um, and of course, we know how short scale our thinking is. But I think there's a lot of wisdom in what you say around, um, you know, not boiling the ocean, which is really what you're describing. And we have seen uh, some examples of people who've really tried to do everything, absolutely everything. Uh, and, and clearly, um, uh, the likelihood is that won't really be as helpful as people who do a few things extremely well. So um, over to you, Jan, now, because um, the same issue around European integration, but I think, and coordination, but I think it's also important to really start thinking much more. I mentioned secondary use of data. We have some examples in Europe um, and some work in Europe, which is going on at the moment around secondary uh, uh, use of data, um, using some examples, even from places like Finland with FinData, um, you know, independent um, um, uh, institutes specifically set up to manage this process for research, for pharma, and, you know, for, for the things we understand. Um, uh, how, how do you feel this is going? Is there more we should be doing? We should be doing? Because, I mean, this is our joint responsibility. It's not just going to happen. We have to drive this. Uh, mm -hmm. And the reason for these seminars is really to assist all of us in actually understanding how best to do that. Yeah, Charles, you, you, you mentioned the word yourself. It's about collaboration. We have to do it together. There is no single part of our industry, neither the hospitals nor the, 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 uh, the corporate world, nor government by itself that can make this happen. It's, an, it's a concerted action that we, we have to really want this, to, to have a desire because it's good for our patients to make sharing of data easier than it is now. Now, we can, we can team up and start the dialogue and have the dialogue and do the lobbying. And that is what we are doing continuously. We are working in Brussels. We are working with the, with the national governments. We are working with, with the uh, professional societies, with individual doctors in order to make the story strong. That is something that we can do together. 
But then each and every one of us has also a peculiar own task. And I will not talk about the tasks of the doctors. I think Peter and Afsal can talk about that better than I can do. And the, and the C-suite of hospitals, the same thing. But at the site of the industry, we have the obligation to, to make our digital world interoperable, easy to use, that it cannot be locked in. We cannot have an EMR anymore that, that locks in all its data. Yeah. Or we cannot come to the, to the world as Philips with a remote patient monitoring device, whatever it is, that does not speak or talk with all the, 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 the possible EMRs in the world. So interoperability is very much important. That's one thing. And the second thing that we as an industry has, are accountable for, uh, at least for a big part, is data safety and security. If, if, if our customers are, and, our, our, and the patients, our consumers, are using our digital tools, they should be, these data that they deliver there should be safe and secure. So that is two things that, that we as a company take very seriously on top of the concerted action of driving the whole data sharing idea uh, uh, in the society. Privacy and security, interoperability, and then working together in driving the whole, the whole thing forward. Thank you. Um, uh, we're coming up to the uh, top of the hour now. So um, uh, really, I'm going to ask the three of you for um, some final remarks and some uh, key uh, take-homes uh, in terms of you know, what we've discussed today and really what we really should take home and what the audience should take home uh, in terms of next steps from all of us. So let's start with uh, you, Peter. Um, uh, could you give me your sense of what you feel the most important issue for us to take home is and what you, what you have learned from today? I learned a lot about the power of trust and cooperation. And I think this is helpful in any crisis, especially in a crisis with such a complex material like health. And we really should foster those processes that started now to create and maintain trust and collaborate because COVID does not stop at national frontiers or barriers. It's a worldwide pandemic. So we should also act as one. Fantastic. Jan, over to you. Yeah, my learnings or my, my, my take home message would be, don't let us lose everything we learned during the COVID. The creativity, the agility, the, the, the transparency, the collaboration spirit that was there. And second, let's, take very good care of our healthcare professionals and listen to them, talk to them, because if we don't do that, we will lose them on the long run, especially in these very, very challenging times. Yeah. Absal. So, so in, a, in, a, in a similar vein, really, we, we've achieved so much in three months, m much more than we might have achieved in many areas in, in, in two or three years. And there's some other things implicit in what we've been talking about. We spoke about data, but, but out of data not only comes um, uh, uh, operational understandings, but also research. And, and it seems to me, uh, again, uh, as both Jan and Peter said, that that approach not only applies to COVID, our learning has to be how do we beat COVID, if you like, but also how do we apply the same for cardiovascular disease, for cancer, for renal disease, and so on. And, and whilst I recognize that there are many European uh, collaborations, research and clinical and, and, and all sorts of, of very well formulated groups all working uh, in the best possible way, actually, the to, to coin a phrase, they're all reinventing the wheel slightly. Everybody's using their own methodology for sharing data. Everybody's using a slightly different way of coding their data. Let's start to bring these things together so that the tools and the approaches that we develop and understand here become absolutely reusable across the entire spectrum of healthcare. Uh, thank you. And thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, thank you, Jan. And thank you, Afzal. 
um, uh, for joining this uh, really uh, fascinating discussion. And thank you, the audience, too, for joining us uh, and submitting your questions and comments. I look forward uh, to the day when perhaps it will be possible to um, uh, uh, meet the big metal birds in the sky so we could meet uh, together um, uh, again, face to face, in the flesh. Um, and I'd like to thank you personally because I think uh, today was really fascinating, both in terms of the content and also in terms of the insights. Uh, we'd also, of course, like to thank uh, the people we're talking about today who are the healthcare professionals. Uh, they often are put in a place of danger, which they are, uh, sometimes also not in a place of danger with all the tools they need. Um, uh, and also they continue to fight the fight uh, on the front lines. Uh, and I think it's important we thank them. So uh, for the audience, please don't miss out on our HIMSS uh, European Digital event between the 7th uh, and the 11th of September. And you can hear more um, uh, from thought leaders and innovators about implementing and using digital technology to, in, to advance health and care. And you can find uh, more details on our website, HIMSS.org. So thank you all. Thank you. And have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.